So, you want to know about the flow of transactions? This video will cover each transaction used in the healthcare industry and include data examples of the following 834s, 837s, and 835s. Also, this video was in response to a request for an overview and flow chart with actual data transaction examples, and we will cover each of them. To start off with, a prospective subscriber will need to enroll in a healthcare plan. To do this, they will need to submit enrollment information, which is transmitted in an 834. In some scenarios, an 820 premium payment is used for payments. Payments can also be sent with a phone call and credit card or in person. Dallas, show us some 834 examples. And I will go over those right now. This is a standard 834. You can see at the top of the transaction, there's uh, the transaction ID uh, 220. You can see it also in the ST03. Uh, and of course, ST01 shows 834. Uh, you have BG uh, end segment. That's the, top, that's the beginning segment in the transaction. This is an original transaction. And then it goes over the sponsor name. It could also be like your employer, for example. And then in 1000B, uh, your payer is listed in N1, asterisk IN. Uh, of course, you can have different uh, element separators. I'm using asterisks in, in this example. And then on to probably one of the two most important segments in the A34, and that's the INS segment that's located in, in the 2000 loop. Uh, this will include your maintenance reason codes and your maintenance type code. Uh, this loop also includes the REF 0F, which is like your subscriber ID, and also the REF 1L, which is your group or plan ID number, and then benefit dates. Uh, moving on from there, you'll see in the 2100A loop, the NN1IL, which is the subscriber name and his ID, his or her ID, and then the demographics. And in this example, I've also included languages spoken in the LUI uh, segment. Uh, this one is Spanish spoken in red. And then uh, in the 2100G loop, which is uh, an optional loop, you can see the responsible person party in the NN1QD and then their name and ID. Uh, we move on from there to the HD segment, which is the second uh, important segment in the A34. This covers uh, the coverage uh, for the A34 enrollment. This particular example shows that the type of coverage is healthcare for an individual. And it gives your benefit begin date and your DTP for the 348 segment. Uh, if you go on beyond that point, you can see the in the 2310 loop, there's an N1, NM1P3, which is your PCP or primary care physician. And then it goes over his information. So that's a pretty good overview of what that transaction looks like, the 834 transaction. Once a subscriber is enrolled, they have the options to visit a healthcare provider, a doctor, or clinic, for example. When this happens, the provider, a doctor, for example, may send a 270 eligibility request transaction. The 271 EDI transaction that is returned will show the dates and types of coverage. If the procedure is expensive, many providers will send a 278 prior authorization transaction which will return the coverage related to a particular CPT code, the same CPT code sent on the 278 prior auth request. The 837 transaction holds the claim information for the provider. This claim transaction will include doctor credentials, member demographics, and IDs as well as diagnosis codes, charge amounts, and even adjustments. Adjustments may be applied when the claim is an encounter, in other words two or more payers. Dallas, please go over the 837 transactions. This is a standard 837 transaction. You can see in um, the GS segment that it goes over the transaction ID uh, 223. It's also included in the ST03. You can see that this is actually an institutional claim. The professional would be, for example, 222 and dental would be 224. Uh, and this is 5010. So, uh, as we walk through this transaction uh, at a high level, you can see the beginning segment and then the sender and receiver with NM141 and NM140 segments and qualifiers. 
If we move on from there, we see one of the most important loops, the uh, 2010 AA loop. That's your billing provider. And that um, is in the 2010 AA loop. And it includes the NM185 segment with the billing provider's MPI number in the NM109. Uh, XX is the qualifier in NM108. And that just tells us that you can expect a, an MPI number in the NM109. Uh, then, of course, the uh, demographics for the provider uh, is below that. Uh, moving on from there, uh, there's a subscriber level in the 2000B loop, specifically 2010BA includes NM1IL, that's the subscribers segment, inclu includes their name uh, and their member ID in NM109, and then their demographics, uh, including the date of birth in DMG08. Uh, also within the same 2000B loop is the payer. Uh, most of the other loops like billing provider or subscriber, even dependent, they have their own loop. But uh, the way the 837s are built, the, the subscriber and the payer are both underneath the 2000B loop. They do have their own sub loops or, uh, or nested loops. Uh, the 2010BA is is for the subscriber and the 2010 BB is for the payer. And you can see the payer ID, of course, in NM109, where the qualifier is PR. If there was a subscribe, I mean, I'm sorry, a dependent, you would have another loop in there, uh, 2010 CA, which would include NM1QC for a dependent. That, that might be, for example, our son or a daughter that was going in for uh, some sort of healthcare treatment. In the 2300 loop, um, you see the CLM segment, which includes the, the patient ID in CLM01, the total charge in CLM02, and then uh, CLM05 includes uh, the place of service or the build type. The build type is actually CLM51 plus 53. So in this example, you add 11 one plus 1, and, and the build type is 111. Now that's an inpatient build type. If this was, for example, an outpatient institutional claim, it might say 13 colon A colon 1, and the build type for that, of course, is going to be 131. So uh, moving on from there, th this claim segment includes other information. Uh, you have uh, admission dates included here, and then in the DTP 434, this is actually the date range, and it's a required segment for institutions, but the service line date, and the dates at the service line are uh, noted by DTP 472. For the institutional claim, that's situational at the service line level, but not at the claim level. This is required. If this was, for example, a professional claim or a dental claim, then um, they have a requirement to have the 472, uh, at, which is your date of ser your service dates at the service lines in the 2400 loop. So, um, in the 2310A loop, uh, this includes a number of different providers. You can have attending provider, renting provider. You can have surgical providers. You can have other facilities. There's, you know, half a dozen other in and one segments or more that can exist in here. Uh, this particular example shows us uh, an attending provider name. Uh, this is required, of course, when the uh, uh, the in and one. 85 at the 2010 level, that's an institutional claim, so that's actually going to show the name of the hospital, so this will show the name of the doctor. And then uh, the rendering provider is a situational loop, they've included it here. And then you have um, your service lines, which include your SV2 segments. You can note that if it was a professional claim, it would be SV1, institutional is SV2, and for dental service lines, they use an SV3. I'm going to go over also uh, some uh, of the definitions, I guess you would say, of an encounter. I think it might be helpful, uh, so we'll get into that briefly. Also, a, a quick note here. For this flowchart and diagram, what I've tried to do here is show you uh, how these transactions are paired up as they move along um, this flowchart. The 278 request will be sent from the doctor, for example, to the payer, and then the payer will return a 278 response. This transaction uses the same number. I don't know why they did that, but they did. It's actually a different transaction, but they use the same number. Um, the 270 request 
It comes from the provider, like your doctor, for example. And this will show you eligibility, mainly like eligibility dates and types of coverage. And then the 271 is a response back from the payer. So you can see that um, these boxes below show basically the responses from the payer. Uh, the 270 comes from the provider, 271 actually comes from the payer. Uh, with the 834, I kind of paired it with uh, eligibility because eligibility request and response goes over basically your dates uh, of coverage and the enrollment goes over both the dates of coverage and, and your coverage type. But they're so closely related, I put, it those, I put those together. And then of course with the 837, uh, once the claim is adjudicated, it produces the 835. So that's basically how the flowchart works. Once a healthcare claim enters a payer's system, a claim status may be returned upon request. This process uses a 276 claim status request and 277 claim status response. In many cases, a 277 CA or 999 may be returned as an acknowledgement. When a claim is adjudicated, it generates an 835 claim remittance transaction. This transaction will cover full or partial payments. Dallas, show us some 835 examples. Okay, this is an 835. Um, you can see the uh, transaction ID is at the end of the GS segment, and you can see it noted here by 221. Also note that it, the STO3 does not have the transaction ID. It's the only transaction in the HIPAA transactions that does not include the transaction ID on the third element for the 5010. Uh, as we walk through uh, this transaction, you can see the payer identification in 1000A and the payee that would be like the doctor or the hospital in 1000B. As we move through this transaction, uh, you can see the CLP segment in the 2100 loop. Uh, this is probably one of the most important segments in the 835 uh, remittance. Uh, if you look at CLP 3, 4, and 5, these are probably the most important elements in this transaction. CLP 03 is going to tell you the amount that was charged, in this case $10,797. And then uh, CLP 04 is going to tell you the amount paid in, in this example, it's 8,500. And then uh, CLP 05 is going to show you patient responsibility in, in this example, $2,267. Um, the, the member, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the patient is actually right below the CLP segment in the NM1QC uh, segment. And uh, from there, you can also see uh, the service line information and uh, the service date in the DTP 472. And also uh, an equally important segment is the CAS segment in the 2110 level uh, loop. This will go over the types of adjustments that were made. Uh, so for example, uh, you have your group code in CASA 1, and there are up to six different adjustments, they call them triplets, that could be uh, included in a CAS segment and here you have the adjustment. Now this is how much they're not going to pay because of an adjustment reason code. The 45 is an example of, of a adjustment reason code. Some of the early, uh, some other adjustment reason codes could include things like copay, coinsurance, deductible information like that. And you'll find these dollar amounts in CAS 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18. So this will give you a basic overview of what the 835 looks like. Now, let's look at what happens when a claim has more than one payer on it. This is an encounter. When this happens, 837 transaction expands to include additional loops and segments that were not in the original transaction. Specifically, the 2320 loop is added and it contains the first payer to receive the bill. The secondary or tertiary payer will then populate the 2010 BB loop. This is a basic overview with flow. Let us know if you have additional questions. Okay, I'm gonna go over uh, briefly what an encounter is and what it looks like. A counter is basically a paid claim. Uh, in some cases, you'll find uh, where uh, an entity, a technical entity has been con 
contracted, for example, like a medi from a medi state Medicaid agency to perform all the services for Medicaid. And so that entity will actually be Medicaid, as it were, for the state, and they'll take and perform all of the claim adjudication and all the enrollment, all the tasks are involved in the adjudication process. And then they'll take this transaction, which is a paid claim, and they'll send it to the state. And then, you know, that they go through whatever contractual uh, uh, obligations uh, or benefits that they have, for example, reimbursement and, and other details. So let's go over what makes an encounter. Uh, this is an example of a claim as it comes in. And you can see, excuse me for that. This uh, is an example uh, of a standard um, 837 claim. You've got one payer. Is listed right here uh, in the 2010 BB loop. Uh, this first element in the SBR tells us that the payer is a primary. Now right after the SBR you'll see the NN1 IL which is right here and then below that is the NN1 PR. Now remember I mentioned to you that in the 837 these transactions are actually located uh, in the same loop. So when this client comes in, let's say, for example, that uh, we're going to make this first claim, for example, uh, Blue Cross, for example. We're going to say that this is Blue Cross. Okay. Now, if this is going to go uh, to Medicaid, for example, for payment, here's what happens. There are some additional loops that are added right below the 2310 level of loops. There'll be another loop right here, which will be SBR. And it's going to show P for primary or whatever the payer responsibility is, for example. And then it will say Blue Cross. So what's happening is that this payer information that used to be in 2010 BB slides down here into the 2320 loop, specifically a nested loop called 2330B. And what goes up here, for example, the SBR is changed to secondary, for example, and then this is the second pair that gets the claim. We're going to say Medicaid. So you can see that this is what happens uh, when a claim is sent from one pair to the other because it was paid and goes to another, another pair. And so this is an encounter, and it, in this case it goes to Blue Cross, and you'll see an SBR in this segment. Uh, at, this is at the um, claim level, so you could see a CAS adjustment at the claim level. You usually don't, but you should see a, an AMTD, which will give you uh, the payer paid amount. Okay, and then uh, you might also see an AMT EAF, which uh, is going to be patient responsibility, for example. Okay, and then uh, you might also see some other information like DTP uh, 573, for example, the check date. Okay, so this information is included here um, uh, at this level. There's also the NM1IL, that's for your other insured information, and NM1PR, uh, which is going to be the payer information. And at the end of that, you're going to have... Um, your other payer ID. Now this is important because this number right here is going to be used in the 2430. So if you have an encounter, then you're most likely going to have an SVD segment. And then that payer ID that I just typed up is going to be there. And then here is going to be uh, the paid amount. I'm going to say line paid amount because that's what it is. And then from there, you'll have, for example, any sort of adjustments uh, that, that might be uh, applicable to this claim. Okay, so this is really uh, what is happening in an encounter. The first pair that was in the 2010 BB loop slides down into the 2330B. It's like another claim inside of a claim, okay? And then in addition to that, 
some additional segments are added at the service line which shows the amount paid so this SVD01 is pointing to the 2330B, 2330B loop, which is this payer. In this case, it would have been Blue Cross, for example. When Blue Cross paid, they're going to show how much they paid per line and any adjustments that were made. A CAF segment um, has a group code in the CAS01, and that uh, dictates the type of adjustments for the entire segment. Now, there are actually six up to six uh, adjustments that could be made per one CAS segment. Uh, the CAS 02 is going to show you, for example, the adjustment, uh, the claim adjustment reason code, we call them CART codes, and then um, the adjustment amount. Again, there could be up to six of these, and they're called triplets. The dollar amounts are basically going to be in CAS 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18. Okay? And... Um, if uh, if you're going to balance the claim, for example, you're going to take um, the uh, amount paid here for each charge line and add them all together, and they're going to equal the number right here in, in the AMTD amount. So um, that's probably a lot deeper than I was going to go in uh, you know this walkthrough of a flow, but I think it's a really good uh, overview for how encounters work. I, I think that you could use those examples to help you understand uh, how the encounters work uh, for what you're looking at. There's another flavor of encounters called subrogation, which works a little bit differently. And if you're interested, I can make another video there. So I hope that this helps out. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can leave uh, a comment below or you can send me a question to edi.dallas.zoho. Thanks. I hope this has helped out and thanks for watching my video.